In this lesson, we're going to take a look at how to analyze a categorical variable, and specifically, we're going to focus on frequency tables, bar graphs, and pie charts. So before we get to the frequency table, which is a way that we're going to summarize categorical data, I want to talk about the data in general. So over on the left here, I have a snippet of uh, some data that I used in order to create some of the graphics in the frequency table in this lesson. It's not all of the data, but it gives you a good idea what it should look like. A couple notes on data when we're dealing with it is we should have one variable per column, which you can see we have timestamp, gender, what is your age, year in school, and major. Now, some of these variables are categorical and some of them are quantitative. And we're going to focus on categorical variables in this lesson. And examples of categorical variables would be the gender, the year in school, and the major. So this was a survey that I sent out to my intro stat students. And they responded, and I used this to create some data in order to use in class for some of the lessons that we take a look at to make it a little bit more interesting. Um, and you'll notice that there's some issues with some of the data. For example, this question, what is your age? This is a quantitative variable. The response is a quantitative variable. And you can see that some of the values are missing. That means individuals chose not to answer some of those questions. Year in school, I did this as a radio button question, so I wouldn't have to deal with any cleaning of the data. So they only had five choices, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, or super senior. Now, they could choose one of those five choices or they could ignore it and not answer that question as well. But it forced it to be certain categories when we take a when we take a look at this which we'll see in a little while now the last one is another categorical variable which is ma major or plan major and i just want to present this real briefly because sometimes there's issues when we create surveys or other things that we're trying to get data from so for example bms is really biomedical sciences but when we talk about biomedical sciences for the measurement here versus biomedical sciences for the measurement here, those are two different measurements. Those are two different categories when we do the analysis. And there's a third one down here. If you notice, there's biomedical sciences right here rather than biomedical science. So we have three different measurements that are really supposed to be the same. So when we when we have issues like this, we do maybe some preliminary data analysis, and then we have to do some data cleaning before we can get the data in a usable format. So I'm gonna focus on year in school for the analysis that we go through for right now so we understand a little bit about frequency tables and then the bar graph and the pie chart when we go through this lesson. Now, a frequency table is used to summarize categorical data. And the frequency table will consist of three things. It'll consist of the category, the frequency, and the relative frequency. Just a side note, the frequency is sometimes called the count, and then the relative frequency can be called the percent or the proportion. And those terms kind of depend on the textbook that you're using or the software that you're using. So let's take a look at the frequency table. You can see that I, I did the frequency table two ways. I'm gonna focus on the upper part first. So for the upper part, we have um, the, the titles category, which is year in school. Then we have our frequency or our count and then our relative frequency for the respective columns. And I have those listed in order from the least amount of school completed to the most amount of school completed. And then the no response is last. So basically what I did is I went through I didn't do this by hand, by the way. Um, I went through and I counted up the number of individuals that classified themselves as a freshman or categorized themselves as a freshman. There were 82 individuals. There were 214 individuals that classified themselves as sophomores, so on and so forth, for a total of 443 total individuals. So there are 443 students that were surveyed uh, with this questionnaire that I created. Now over here in the relative frequency, in order to calculate the relative frequency, what we do is we take the frequency. If you look over here in the lower left-hand corner, we take the frequency and we divide that by the total or the sample size. So I'm taking 82 and I'm dividing that by 443 in order to get this respective relative frequency. Now with a relative frequency, we can, res we can express it one of three ways. You can express it as a ratio, which is not always very common. More common is either a decimal value or a percentage. So this is the decimal value that's equivalent to 82 out of 443, and this is the percentage that's equivalent to that as well. And we do that respectively for each of the categories to figure out what the respective relative frequency is. Now, one thing to point out is when we calculate the relative frequency, 
if we're doing this by hand, we should always add up these values. And if we add up the, the ratio or the decimal value, those should add up to be approximately one. If we add up the percentages, those better add up to be 100%. Now, sometimes it comes out to be 0.99 or 99%. That might be okay. That might just be due to some rounding that took place up here. But if you end up with a percentage or, or a value of 0.98 or 98% or 0.96 or 96%, you probably did something wrong in one of your calculations up here. So it can also be a way to kind of check our, our math and make sure that we did this correctly. So this is a, an example of a frequency table done by hand. In the lower right-hand corner of this slide, you'll see that there's another frequency table. This was created using SPSS, which is a statistical software to do this type of analysis with. And you'll notice that in the first column right here, we have the category. You'll notice that there's one blank area right here. This is the non-responses. And then it takes the categories and it puts those in alphabetical order when we take a look at that. And then we have our frequencies. And you'll see that these frequencies match up with what I have up here for the frequencies over there. And at the bottom, we have the total. Now, with the relative frequencies in the SPSS output, this calls this the percent rather than the relative frequencies. So these are the respective percentages and they're only rounded to one decimal place. That's why they look slightly different. So the non-responses you can see are 0.5%, which is very close to 0.45%. And you can see a little bit better with the freshman, that's 18.5% and we have 18.51% for the freshman. You can see that I carried up um, uh, one additional decimal place in my calculations versus SPSS. I'm going to ignore the valid percent right now. Um, I'm going to talk about the cumulative percentage. The cumulative percentage is basically taking the percentages and adding them up as we go down. So for the, the cumulative percentage that's aligned with the row with freshmen in it, the, it's really the 18.5 plus 0.5, and that's what's giving us the 19%. The cumulative percentage for the juniors is really the 23.9 plus 18.5 plus 0.5, and that's giving us the 42.9%. So the cumulative percentage might be something that's used for, something we might use if we're constructing a Pareto chart. And there's certainly other things that we might want to use the cumulative percentage for. So the, the SPSS output for the frequency table gives us a little bit more information than what we necessarily need, but it's good information, we can use it. So these are descriptive statistics for categorical variables that we're looking at right here. The frequency, the relative frequency expressed as one of those three ways, those are descriptive statistics. Now let's take a look at some graphics. The first graphic that I'm gonna present is called the pie chart. The pie chart is a graphical representation of the relative frequency. And it's typically the percentage that we're using in order to make these wedges the proportion of the whole that they represent. So we have freshmen right here. Um, I believe the freshmen were about 18.5%. So that's what that wedge should represent as the whole. And then we have uh, sophomores over here, which is this larger wedge right here. Now the purpose of a pie chart is really to take an individual and be able to compare that to the whole um, unit, okay? So we had 443 students that were surveyed, and now we can compare those, um, I think it was 82 freshmen and compared to the whole unit right there. So a pie chart is used to compare individuals to the whole. Each graphic that we construct, there's going to be a purpose for that graphic in terms of the information it conveys. So we want to keep that in mind when we think about the pie chart. The next graphic I want to take a look at is the bar graph. The bar graph takes each of the individual categories and it plots their height in terms of a rectangular bar. And that rectangular height can be um, uh, determined by the count or the frequency, or it could be determined by the percent or the relative frequency. So the graphic on the left is the count or the frequency, and the graphic on the right is the percent. Now, when we look at the two of these, you can see there's not a drastic difference between these two in terms of their bar heights. And there might be times when we want to choose one over the other. So sometimes we have one bar that is significantly larger than all the others, and in that case, it might be more advantageous to use the percent because it'll make those smaller bars come into view a little bit better when we use the percentages versus the actual counts or the frequencies. So there's advantages to those. Now, if you're presenting information to a general audience, you might argue that the count is a little bit better because most people understand whole numbers a little bit better than they understand percents or relative frequencies. 
Now the purpose of a bar graph is really to compare one individual to another individual. We can't really see the whole, but we can see individual to individual to how these things compare. So that's the importance of the bar graph. So remember a pie graph is com to compare an individual to the whole, and a bar graph is to compare an individual to an individual. The last graphic that I'm going to present doesn't deal with this data. Oh, one, one thing before I get to the last graphic. One thing that's really important in using graphics is that when we're using graphics, we should pay attention to how we create those. And what I want to talk about is the use of color. Most individuals are very sensitive to the way that things look, and we, we tend to look at things visually before we look at numerical measurements and labels and other things that we put on graphics. So if we're creating a presentation or a flyer or something like that to communicate individuals to an, or information to an audience, one of the things we want to pay attention to is the use of color. We want to make it very easy for an individual to follow through your report logically. So if I had these two graphics in my report, I would make sure that I am uh, considerate in the fact that I used orange for my sophomores over here, and I'd also want to use orange for my sophomores in my, bi in, my, in my bar graph in order to make sure that those two graphics match up. Same thing, juniors are in red here in the bar graph and juniors are in red in there. It makes it much easier to follow and allows for a lot less confusion when people are looking at it. Again, keep in mind that individuals are very visual in the way that they see things. So when we create graphics, we should have that visual representation of that information in mind as we create those. Now on to the last graphic. The last graphic I want to talk about is the Pareto chart. This is a bar graph that's used for problem solving, and there's a few different things that are going on here. I think the bars are self-explanatory, but you'll notice that the bars are organized with the largest bar first and the smallest bar last. And we're using the counts or the frequencies on the scale on the left, and that's to reference the bars right here. You'll notice another thing. We have this line that goes through here with these diamonds. These diamonds are the cumulative percentage right there of the bars. So if I add the unable to download bar up with the can't find the file bar, that cumulative percentage is going to be approximately 75%, maybe 70%, and so on and so forth. So we're looking at the cumulative percentage of those things, and the percentages are given on the scale on the right right here. Now this is a great problem solving tool, and oftentimes you'll see this if you're um, in, in the areas of business and engineering, certainly not limited to those, but those are two of the areas that I've done some work in, and we've used these extensively in there. What the Pareto chart does, it allows us to prioritize what's most important and what's least important to solving a problem. So if I'm solving a problem that deals with some IT issue, which all these seem to be about IT issues, um, we wouldn't want to start down here on the far right that says uh, doesn't work in open office because we're not solving the majority of the problem. In other words, we're not taking care of the pain point of, the, of a good majority of individuals or customers that are using our products. We want to start over here on the far left with the greatest magnitude because that's going to influence the majority of the people. So if I solve this problem, I'm taking, taking care of approximately 50% of the problem. If you follow that diamond over the right, that's showing me that's about 50%. The next bar, if I take care of the next bar as well, now I've solved about 75% of the problem. And the goal is generally to get above 80% of the problem. So this dashed line right here, you'll notice is right at 80% right there. So in order to exceed 80% of the uh, problem or solve the pain point for 80% of the individuals, I'd have to go through these first three bars and I'm right here. And then at that point, we might have to reevaluate whether or not these other things are things that really need to be solved or those are other issues that might be taken care of by some of these earlier issues right there. So the Pareto chart is a really great problem solving tool for uh, examining and prioritizing categorical data in terms of looking at it. Now the last thing I want to talk about is variability in categorical data. And I think variability is a little bit easier to see in a bar graph versus looking at uh, a measurement for variability. So I have these two bar graphs here. One represents high variability and one represents low variability. So let me explain this just a second. So this was obviously on some sort of survey about bringing the troops home or keeping them in Iraq. And you can see that the, the individuals that responded to this survey are 50% for bringing them home and 50% for keeping them in Iraq. 
So this is really high variability because we have a lot of disagreement between the individuals. We have about half of them that want to bring them home and half of them that want to keep them in Iraq. So we have some variability there, considerable variability. Now, low variability, on the other hand, you'll notice that I have right decision, which is 90%, and wrong decision, which is 10%. Now, this is low variability in this case right here because the majority of the individuals agree with this right decision right here. A small minority of individuals agree with this wrong decision. So there is very low variability here, and you see that there is a pretty significant difference in the bars. So when you think about variability and looking at them in a bar graph, the closer the heights are together, the higher the variability is. The bigger the difference between the bars, the more variability there is within that uh, categorical variable that you're looking at. Now the last thing, whenever we are choosing a graphic, we have to take into consideration a couple things. The first thing that I always ask, ask myself before I choose the graphic is what type of variable am I analyzing? If it's categorical or qualitative is another term for categorical, I'm going to choose certain graphics like you see here, like the pie chart, the bar graph, or the Pareto chart. If it's a quantitative variable, I might choose some of these other graphics like the histogram, the dot plot, the box and whisker plot, the stem and leaf plot. Those are specific graphics for those specific variable types right there. Now, the other thing that I ask after I identify the variable is what type of information am I trying to convey to my audience? And we just talked about some of the categorical variables, so I'll talk about those graphics specifically. If I'm trying to compare an individual to the whole, I'm probably going to choose a pie chart. That's the best graphic for that. If I'm trying to compare an individual to an individual, I will choose a bar chart or a bar graph. And if I'm using uh, the, the information or the categories as a problem solving tool, I might want to look at a Pareto chart. So those are some of the different graphics and some of the different ways that we might choose and use the graphics and they're certainly not limited to the graphics that are presented here there's many other graphics and there's many other things that we can create and construct to represent information but these are some of the common ones that we'll examine hopefully this gives you a little insight on using and creating graphics and later on i'll have other um, lessons on uh, that are related to categorical variables